Okay, so I am finishing our psalm series this weekend um, called Real Hope for Real People. And I do want to take a moment and say hello to anyone who's watching the video. I know my grandmother is watching it in Newfoundland, so hi, Nan. Uh, and to anyone else that is, is tuning in online, um, it's great that you're joining us. And um, yeah, we're finishing our psalm series uh, on Psalm 139. And what I love about the psalms, most of the Bible is um, God speaking to us and God's instruction for us. What I love about the psalms is they are us speaking to God. Um, it's people writing in their reality and their humanity, crying out to God in a variety of different ways. Sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're upset, sometimes they're mad. Um, and so the psalms are really cool in that way. Um, and so this weekend, we're going to look at a really popular psalm, uh, which is Psalm 139. So if you have your Bibles with you tonight, I'd encourage you to go there, um, as we're going to actually take some time in a few minutes to read through most of it. Um, and this weekend, we're talking about loneliness. And so um, thinking about loneliness, I'm sure everyone uh, here has felt lonely at one time or another. I know I have felt lonely in my life on many occasions. And so as we think about it, what are different things that cause loneliness or what, what types of situations cause us to be lonely? Um, as I was thinking about this and trying to be my social media relevant self, um, the first thing I thought of was the forever alone dude. And I think I have a picture of him. Maybe. There he is, does anyone know that guy? Forever alone. So, uh, some of the older people are like, that's just a really bad drawing. Why is that funny? Um, there's this thing on the internet with like the next gens these days are all silly. And uh, whenever they see, like, find themselves alone or like, you know, they just found out that like two of their friends are dating or got engaged, um, they're like, you know, to themselves, they're like, forever alone, like, I'll never have anyone, I'll never be with me. And I think, um, I think teens kind of use this kind of like as a joke to like soften the blow, but I think deep down, um, there is a real sadness to being like, oh my gosh, am I going to be forever alone? Um, if you're a younger person, maybe, you know, you find out through Twitter or Facebook that there was a party at someone's house that you never even were told about and never got invited to. Um, maybe your life is just so busy that like people are inviting you to like hang out or go for coffee and you just can never go because you don't have time, you can't seem to fit it in. Um, or maybe you have, you know, someone who's considered your best friend. I have two of my best friends live in Halifax and sometimes months or even a year can go by and I don't see them. They're only two and a half hours down the road. Um, but we're just so busy that it's hard to find time to see each other and we can feel kind of lonely in that, you know, we're not hanging out with people enough, we're not seeing people enough, like is there something wrong with me or, or what's going on here? Um, we ask ourselves, does anyone miss me or do people notice if I'm, if I'm not there? I think sometimes we can experience a different kind of loneliness or maybe we're, we are with people in the room but we just don't feel on the same wavelength as them. And I was thinking about this, um, I was thinking about the show Big Bang Theory, I don't know if anyone here watches that. Um, I can't help but feel really bad for Penny sometimes on that show because the show is basically a bunch of like really smart, like nerdy people and then Penny is like, I painted my nails pink today. And like that's all she can think of to talk about and she feels really out of the conversation, out of the picture a lot on that show. Um, you know, sometimes we can feel lonely in that we can be in a room with people but we can't seem to hold a proper conversation with others. Um, or we just feel really out of place or super awkward. We're like, I have nothing in common with the people that I'm trying to talk to. Like this is really bizarre. And so we can ask ourselves, you know, does anyone really understand me? If, am I connecting with anyone on any real level or am I just kind of here and people say hi to me because they're just trying to be nice, but really we aren't connecting at all. I think some people experience um, existential loneliness and I think about people that don't believe in any sort of a God or supreme being, people that would call themselves atheists, that think we are completely alone in the universe. And they ask the question, does anything really matter? We're all gone in 100 years anyway. Like, no one out there really cares. We're just a bunch of cells, and we're going to go, you know, back to dust, and then it's all over. So we feel kind of like, what's the point of anything? And that can be an example of loneliness. And then to flip that completely around, I think there can actually be loneliness for Christians as well when we think about sin and the fall. And if you think back to um, Genesis and the story of Adam and Eve, when they sinned for the first time and God came looking for them, what did they do? They hid. They actually hid away from God. And so 
Um, they just felt so ashamed before God that they tried to ignore him or hide from him, and I think we can do that in our lives too. So even though God is, you know, supposed to be with us, we can actually hide from him because of our guilt or shame or whatever, and so then we can actually feel lonely even from God himself. You know, it's interesting because as I've been thinking about loneliness and um, especially, you know, um, the next gens that I work with, we are the most socially connected generation that there ever has been with um, Twitter and Instagram and Periscope is the latest app now where you can live broadcast yourself to the whole world whenever you feel like it. Um, so we are the most socially connected generation, but we're also the loneliest generation, which doesn't seem to make sense. Um, I was reading a Barna research study from 2013 and this is what it said. As a nation, they're talking about the US, but Canada's basically the same. As a nation, we are embracing the digital revolution, and ironically, we are becoming a lonelier population. While there are many benefits of being participants and possibly the most relationally connected age in human history, the social media revolution has not made us feel more connected, less lonely, or replete with friends. So even though I can have, I think, 697 people follow me on Twitter right now, that doesn't make me any less lonely if I'm feeling lonely some night, right? Because they're like friends or followers, but there's like a, a wall around it. Um, it's not authentic community. It's not real um, deep friendships. It's all very surfacey. And so, um, you know, at youth group, I know sometimes we have kids that want to have their heads in their cell phones all the time. And we're like, the phone goes away at youth because we want you to actually be talking to real people and be developing authentic relationships. And so it's loneliness, I really think, is a bit of an epidemic in our society. I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with, and maybe people struggle with it silently and don't really know how to fix it or, or what to do about it. And so I want to take a look at Psalm 139 tonight and read about the inescapable God. Because when we think about loneliness and then we look at Psalm 139, it actually provides a lot of uh, comfort and maybe some concern to some people. So if you have your Bibles, um, I'm going to read Psalm 139. I'm actually going to plow through like 18 verses of it, so bear with me, but it's a good psalm. This is what it says. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the furthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Now for anyone who's feeling lonely, that psalm has a lot of good things to say to us, doesn't it? This psalm tells us that God knows everything about us. He knows what we're doing. He knows what we're thinking. Um, he knows what we're going to say even before we say it. So whether it's a good thing or maybe not a good thing, he already knows kind of what's going to come out of our mouths before we say it. God goes before us everywhere we go. There's great comfort in knowing that no matter what we're going through or where we are in our life, God is with us. He's always beside us. And we see this all, like all the time throughout scripture. You know, it always says, be strong and courageous, do not fear, I am with you. I am with you, do not be afraid. That is all over the place in the Bible. 
There's also great comfort in knowing that God already knows what has happened, what we have thought or done in the past. And I think this really speaks to the last element of loneliness I was talking about, that sometimes, um, you know, if we're struggling with something and we're trying to hide from God like Adam and Eve did, um, there's really no sense in doing that, is there? Because according to this psalm, God already knows. He, he's already been there. It says in verses 11 and 12, um, you know, the psalmist says that he tries to hide in the darkness, but it says even the darkness is as light to you. So there can be real comfort in knowing that, you know, as much as sometimes we feel like we need to put on a happy face for those around us, we don't have to do that with God because he knows exactly what's going on and he knows us at that deep level. He knows us so well that he knows what's best for us, and he knows us even better than we know ourselves. You know, one of the times when loneliness is commonly felt, at least in my life, is when I'm going through a particularly dark valley, and maybe that's true for you too. Um, We feel lonely in the dark times um, because we sometimes feel that no one can really understand what we're going through. Maybe we've gone through an incredible loss. Maybe there is a sickness in our family that Um, our friends just haven't experienced before, and so they're trying their best to, like, be there for you, but you just feel so alone because how could anyone understand what you're going through? As I was thinking about this, um, Pastor Dave gave me a book, um, and one of the authors is Dan Allender. The book is called Encouragement, the Key to Caring, and in this book, uh, Allender talks about the virtue of loneliness, which I thought was an interesting way of putting it, Um, and he says that how when we have no other choice Um, in our loneliness, but to turn to God, we will come to know more of him. Um, Dan, in his book, tells of a story of a man in his late 20s whose wife was very sick with cancer. The man asked Dan to read to him from the Psalms, and so he read Psalm 142, verse 3, which says, when I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. And Psalm 73, verses 25 and 28, which says, Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. See, in this man's incredible darkness of his situation, he had nowhere left to turn but to God himself. The author goes on to describe loneliness as a surprising opportunity to know God, And it comes as we depend on God to minister to us. God is always with us, even in the darkest circumstances. And sometimes I really believe it's in those valleys that we come to know God even closer because we have no one else that really understands. We can really see from this psalm and also from the larger narrative of of scripture that God is always near us, and we know that. And I feel like a few weeks ago when I was talking about connecting our brain to our heart, we're kind of in a similar situation here, which, shock of all shocks, is kind of always our problem. Um, We know that God is near us, but we don't always necessarily feel close to God, do we? There are times in our life when we feel like God is distant, even though scripture is telling us God is always near. So why is that? Um, I want to ask all of you tonight, how can we know Psalm 139 to be true in our hearts and not just in our heads? See, a relationship with God is just like any other relationship that we have um, in our lives. Our relationship with God needs to be cultivated in order for it to have any significance in our life. We need to be going to God daily, openly and honestly, just like the psalmist did. And uh, actually, (laughs) there is some real honesty in Psalm 139, if you continue to read. Some of you may have noticed that I stopped at verse 18. Uh, If you keep going, uh, verse 19 to 22, he actually gets kind of mad at people for stuff. Uh, It's kind of, it's really interesting. Um, If you go back to Psalm 139 and read verses 19 to 22, he basically is like, God, please destroy the wicked I hate the people who you hate, so please get rid of them. And it's kind of like, whoa, where did that come from? Like Psalm 139 was going along just just fine until he hit there. Um, But then at the end, the last two verses, which are really um, kind of popular, and I believe Ardith even referenced them in worship, um, he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. 
probably like the last few verses I just wrote down, um, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. And so we see here that the psalmist is being very open and honest with God, and that's what I love, like I said earlier about the psalms, is that they don't kind of dress it up and say, hey God, everything is great, and I'm this like rock star writer of the Old Testament, and I'm going to be perfect. It's like, no, he actually, (laughs) Psalm 139 kind of goes off the rocker a little bit here towards the end, but then the psalmist does end by saying, God, please test me, please make me more into your image. See, I think often we treat Christianity not as an honest, open, authentic relationship where we can be real with God, but we treat it more as a transactional agreement. We go to God and say, you know, God, hey, I, I've sinned, I'm a sinner, I need your grace and forgiveness, please forgive me. And then God goes, okay, you are forgiven. Great, thanks so much, have a great life, off I go. And we just see it like that. But our walk with Jesus isn't just a transactional, a, a business transaction, that's not all it is. Our relationship with Jesus is walking in the presence of God on an ongoing daily basis. Working on that relationship is essential to our life with Christ. And we do that through spiritual disciplines and through the community and the church. And so when we take time to pray and to talk with God and listen to him, when we take time to read his word and let it speak to us, when we take time to come together in a place such as this and worship him, when we have conversations in small groups, um, all of those things help to build the relationship with God, no different than those things with you know, your friends or your family build those relationships as well. You know, in verse 17 in Psalm 139, um, the psalmist says, how precious are your thoughts about me, O God. And so the psalmist is saying, your thoughts about me are so precious. I, I want to know more of them. I want to know more about you. I wonder if we think the same thing, that God, your thoughts are so precious. I want to know more of them. If we had that mindset in our relationship with God, I think spending time with him and being authentic and open with him would, be, uh, would come much more easily. When we learn to walk with God in the good times, um, that ensures that we are able to cling to him in the dark times. And we have no better example of this than with Jesus himself. When we talk about cultivating a relationship with God so we don't have to feel lonely, Um, As I was preparing this sermon and talking with Dave and with Brent, um, our minds actually went to the life of Jesus. And we know that Jesus came to this earth to be an example to us in how uh, we are to live and also in how to be in community with the Father. Um, Jesus prayed a lot when he was on the earth. When he got busy or overwhelmed, he uh, left everyone and and went off to pray. Um, Jesus studied scripture a lot, and he had a lot of it memorized and was able to just speak it when he needed to. And Jesus was in authentic community with other people, with real people, with sinners, with his disciples, with a whole bunch of people. Um, He really is the ultimate example of how to walk with God while on earth. And all of this in his life really prepared him for the ultimate dark time that was going to come in his life. And uh, that was you know, of course, what he did for us on the cross. But this all really started in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so I want to actually turn right now to the New Testament. If you have your Bibles, you can go to Matthew chapter 26. As I get there myself, here we go. Matthew 26 and verses 36 to 46 is when uh, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is really a turning point in the story of Jesus. So I'm going to read it to you now. Then Jesus went with them, with his disciples, to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go there to, over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, If it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. (laughs) Ever feel lonely? (laughs) He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left a second time and prayed, My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. 
So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep, have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. This is certainly a turning point of Jesus' time on earth. Talk about feeling lonely, right? He brought his like closest friends with him to the garden to have this really hard conversation with God, and he, he wanted his friends to what? To have his back, to pray for him, to be there for him. And so he kind of trusts them with that. He goes to the garden to pray, comes back, they're asleep. <laughs> they aren't even able to uh, stay awake. Um, times were really about to get hard in Jesus' life, and his friends couldn't even stay awake with him. And actually, if you continue going through the story of the journey to the cross, there's many occasions where his friends, his disciples, just aren't quite cutting it and kind of being there for him in those moments. Jesus was ready to walk the lonely road because of his relationship with his father. It wasn't because of his friends that were being so awesome in their abilities to pray or anything. Um, It was his relationship with God that really got him through this extremely dark and lonely time. And Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. So the question I want to leave you with this evening is this, how do we prepare for our own Gethsemane experiences? Because I'm sure all of us have already faced hard times in our life, and we all will face times in our lives when our friends are going to let us down, just like Jesus' friends did, Um, or our families won't be there for us, and it's going to be just you and God. All of us are going to experience loneliness at some point. So what do we do with our pain? What do we do with our feelings of rejection? Or what do we do with our sin that is isolating us? Well, I really think we need to do as Jesus did and as the psalmist did. Bring it to God and be real and authentic about it. And Jesus did this even as he was praying. He said in the garden, you know, God, if it's possible, take this from me. But not my will, but yours be done. And as I said earlier in Psalm 139 verses 19 to 24, right? The psalmist was basically like, I'm angry and I hate these people. I just want them gone. But then he says, but show me what offends you about my mindset and lead me in the way everlasting. The best cure for loneliness is to be authentic, open, and honest with God. Being honest before God cultivates a real relationship with him. You draw near to him as you're honest with him, and then he, in return, draws near to you. And we don't have to worry about being too honest with God. There's really no such thing. Um, God can handle anything because he already knows everything, and he knows the plan he has for your life, and he knows what he wants to do with your life. And so the more honest we can become with God, um, the more that loneliness will be at bay because we realize that we have the God of the universe with us at all times. God has searched my life, and he knows me. He knows everything about me. Even when I feel lonely, which is going to happen, I'm never truly alone. God is there to comfort, to guide, and to love all of us. Let's just take a few moments to pray. God, thank you that you have searched me and you know me. God, thank you that you know everyone in this room on a really deep and intimate level. God, thank you that you love us so much that you want to have a relationship with us. God, you want to be our friend and our father and our comforter and our healer. God, I know that at times in our life, all of us in this room have felt lonely. God, we've all had friends that have disappointed us. We've all had family members that have let us down. We've all had experiences, God, where we just felt like nobody uh, could really understand. No one could really get where we're coming from. And God, we just had no one to turn to. God, I pray that in these moments, but in all moments, that we uh, will learn to turn to you. Thank you, God, that even when you feel distant, you are always right beside us. You are always walking with us. I pray, God, that you would help us to learn how to Um, grow our relationship with you. Help us, God, to set time aside each and every day to work on our relationship with you. Thank you that you love us and you care for us, and I just pray that you would help us always to know that you didn't just come to this earth so that we could 
be saved from sin and that be the end of it. But God, you came to this earth so that we could have an ongoing daily relationship with you and that we could come to know you better as you know us. God, I just pray that you would be with each one in this room. And God, if there is someone um, listening to this message that is experiencing um, a deep sense of loneliness today, I just pray, God, that you would draw near to them, that they would open up to you and realize that you were always with them, that you were there, and that you care for them. God, we thank you so much for the gift of your spirit and for the community we can experience with you. And God, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.